Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, after discussing on the origin of human ecology and also we have covered the Chicago school uh, wherein uh, the human ecology had was initially being conceived and in this lecture we, we would just uh, have an overview of the theoretical approach uh, which is being uh, very much used in human ecology and they are environmental determinism and environmental possibilism. Now, what is environmental determinism and what exactly is determinism? Now, in a very simple sense, we can say that environment strongly uh, influence or if not uh, tends to uh, determine the behavior if not the culture of human society. Now, environmental determinism is uh, the first theoretical approach which were uh, being used uh, in order to look at the development of human ecology. Now, for instance, uh, the geographer Frederick Redgeld uh, from Germany and his American disciple Alan C. Sample were the first to espouse uh, the view that humans were completely the product of their environment. That is a theory that come to be called environmental determinism. Now, if we look around globally, we can cite certain examples of uh, human society where their environment influences the behavior or determine their behavior. Now, if we take an examples of the Eskimos, which were in a sense perceived to be uh, primitive if not seen to be a nomads and uh, this is primarily because of the kind of uh, the hearse condition in which they habit I mean uh, habited. Now, in a sense this kind of environment or the habitat which they uh, inhabit to some extent has influenced them uh, in order to uh, go on with that kind of culture. Now, one of the recent works which is uh, being uh, carried forward by the historian James C. Scott. Uh, if, if, if you would like to further look into uh, this uh, on the idea of this environmental determinism. He actually made an extensive study in South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, wherein he tried to look at the kind of uh, the terrain which or the landscape which, which, which are being uh, inhabited by mostly the mongoloid race and in, in, in one of uh, the works of James C. Scott, you can actually see uh, wherein he argued why civilization cannot climb the hills. Now, in that 
he tries to come up with an idea that the highlander or those who inhabit the upland were in a sense purposely trying to evade uh, civilization or evading the state. Now, ideally this concept of state or the modern state is something which is to be seen uh, in, in, in relationship with how the civilization comes into being. Now, there are communities who in essence purposely tends to evade uh, the state and have their own kind of uh, sort of their means of livelihood. Now, in that you can actually see the kind of uh, geographical landscape, how they are being influenced by the kind of uh, agriculture practices, for instance, the zooming if not sifting cultivation. Now, why are these people practicing these uh, agriculture practices? Now, what James Scott find out and argued is in a way these agriculture practices were easy for them to move on or find newer pastures or newer areas, so that they are not confined to a single uh, physical landscape. Now, the reason why I partly discuss James C. Scott uh, work is, if you would like to in a sense uh, try to look further of the relationship between this environment and how it influences the culture, if not uh, uh, a cultural community. You can further refer to the work of James C. Scott. Now, moving on, what actually is environmental determinism? This deterministic approach, in a sense, dominate uh, the influence in the explanations, and it is primarily based on the assumption that cultural and natural areas are coterminous that is nature and culture because culture represents uh, an adaptation to the particular environment. Now, this is uh, uh, espoused by Stewart. Now, in this if you look at the relationship between nature and culture and with a vis adaptation. Some of the maybe agriculture practices or maybe who those who carried forward the uh, pastoralism or any kind of economic production. For that matter, it is being uh, something which is decided by uh, not just the culture group, but rather it is the environment in which that community adapt or in a sense uh, are influenced by their environment. Now, therefore, these environmental factors to some extent determine uh, the human social and cultural behavior. Now, for instance, if you look at the kind of uh, let us say the food and drink uh, practices. Now, even the food habits which, which in essence are influenced by the environment and in environment to some extent uh, strongly determined uh, the human social and cultural behaviors. Now, or maybe the kind of dress or if not clothing is also to some extent determined by the let us say the environment. Now, you can in a sense look at the diverse form of uh, human social and cultural behavior if not uh, the kind of uh, cultural traits which uh, human have practices over the years or over the past generations 
in a sense is not something which is uh, created uh, overnight, but rather which has been partially evolving over a different uh, generations. Now, by saying so, we do not, uh, we, we should not perceive that culture as such is static, rather it is changing and evolving. And uh, there are some recent works which looks at how the climate change in a sense uh, influences or rather the cult agriculture practices of many communities. Now, they find a way out to how to adapt the kind of environmental changes. Now, these are to be seen in the context of how a human society or community tends to adapt with the changing uh, environment. Now, therefore, this environmental determinism in a sense has to be located in the context of uh, the culture and nature relationship. Now, in the upcoming lectures, we will try to also look at uh, the debates on nature and culture and how this perception of nature and culture has changes and how it is to be situated in the context of the modern development paradigm. Now, one of the main emphasis which is being uh, laid by determinism is also on the philosophical position that people have uh, perceived their relationship between man and nature. Now, there are some works uh, which, which perhaps uh, now the works of like uh, Murray Bookchin and also there are many environmental philosophers who tends to uh, locate the relationship between man and nature. Now, there is a, a Norwegian philosopher by the name called Arne Ness. He come up with a term, coined a term called deep ecology and in that deep ecology, he tends to espouse an idea wherein human needs to engage more deeply in order to understand the ecological crisis which we humans have witnessed. Now, in deep ecology, what he uh, mainly emphasized was the self-realization. That is, human needs to understand themselves first. That is, we need to situate ourselves in the context of the ecosystem. Now, deep ecology in essence is uh, in opposition to anthropocentrism. Now, in anth anthropocentrism, it, it believes in the superiority of human, that is human is the center of the ecosystem, which means it, it has some sort of an inalienable rights against other beings. Now, this sort of uh, idea of dominance over nature in a sense has to be challenged. Now, therefore, Arnenes to some extent come up with this idea of deep ecology that is deep ecological thinking. Now, we will try to uh, perhaps look in more in depthly about uh, deep ecology in the coming uh, lectures. Now, I am just partly highlighting how the idea of this uh, engagement uh, philosophically between men and nature has to be in a sense uh, situated. Now, how does environmental determine uh, the behavior of human conditioned? In a sense, uh, the human behavior, lifestyles, and the economy of living are to some extent being conditioned by the environment. Now, 
if there is a changes in the environment obviously it will have an impact on the human uh, community now for instance if you look at an example of uh, let's say a dam being a hydro uh, hydro project wherein a dam is to be built now across uh, the globe we can actually witness there are thousands and millions of people who are being displaced by these development projects now if you look at the plights of these displaced people now since they are being displaced from their original uh, habitation it will definitely have an impact on not only their lifestyle, but primarily on their economic conditions. Now, partly these are to be seen as uh, how the environment has a strong or impinges upon the kind of uh, behavior, if not the culture of human. Now, it has to be uh, looked at how the environment has conditions human behavior. Therefore, uh, environmental determinism strongly tries to advocate uh, in looking at that. Now, determinism, what exactly is determinism? Determinism, determinism in a sense gives uh, a maximum emphasis on the value of nature. What is then the value of nature? what if there is a changes in the value of nature. Now, the value of nature can be seen or located from different uh, perspective, uh, the, extri ec the intrinsic and the extrinsic. Now, intrinsically if uh, it, it is to be located, it needs a further exploration rather than just what it appears. It, it's no, it should not be judged from the face value. Now, uh, by saying so, primarily if you in, in the modern context, maybe from the capitalist point of view or the capitalist economic point of view, nature to some extent is seen from a utilitarian perspective. What is utilitarian perspective? It, it tends to equate the value of nature by judging from the output or maybe in the context of the market value. Now, once nature is seen from this perspective, it is uh, seen as more of a commodity. Now, this commodity in a sense from the capitalist economic uh, point of view is seen as something which has to be uh, exploited and then where profit has to be extracted from it. Now, in contrast to this, there is something called a free will approach which uh, lays emphasis on the human capacity and potential that is uh, the individual self. Now, in this it tends to hold that human has a free will capacity to challenge and change the power of nature that is uh, examples like storm, uh, flood, drought etcetera. Now, the question is can human control nature? Uh, there, there are some debates which has been going on. Now, how human has uh, tends to come up with different ideas and to cope or rather to encounter the to encounter the power of this nature that is the natural disasters. Now, the, uh, the second question is can also human modify this force of environment through technology. Is technology 
uh, sort of an answer to look or locate uh, or encounter these changes of nature. Now, you, if you if you look at the evolution of human society, as humans evolve from a simple to a more complex society, so is the kind of technology and tools which we used. And the kind of technology which we use becomes finer and finer depending on uh, the needs or rather how we tends to adapt or cope with the changing nature. Now, therein lies the importance of human consciousness, the ideas which evolve over a period of time is to be seen in terms of uh, human adjustment with nature. Now, this in a sense is to be in a sense symbolizes man's uh, active involvement in the management of the environment. Now, the idea now is thus human able uh, to is human able to manage uh, the environment in a more uh, sustainable manner. The kind of management, the environmental management which we all engage into. Now, this sort of uh, questions needs to be asked. Therefore, uh, we tend to bring in how human tends to adjust or tends to encounter the environment through the modifications of technology. No doubt, uh, through the use of uh, changes of this technology, we humans are able to manage the environment. Therefore, uh, apparently this sort of approach sounds to be uh, quite uh, attractive, but such claims of the environmental determinisms of causal relations between uh, the environment and culture were in a sense easily uh, refuted by certain uh, school of thought. Now, for instance, uh, contradicting to what we had said an example on this uh, environmental determinism, if we look at some of the examples like for instance, the Tasmanians who in essence uh, live in an island not unlike the one inhabited by the English made no ships. Now, the idea is in order to cope or manage living in an island, is it ideally important to build ships, right. Now, in that we can try to uh, in a sense look at why it's, it, it is not just the environment which influences the human society, but rather human tends to behave in a different way because they do not uh, have that consciousness or the urge to in a way build ships even if they are uh, living in an island. Now, therefore, uh, such kind of variations in human behavior uh, in a seemingly similar geographical settings uh, is to be environmentally determined. Now, therefore, environmental determinism is not uh, primarily the answer, rather uh, it has to be seen in a different uh, perspective. Now, we will just uh, briefly look at the second that is environmental possibilism. Uh, what then is environmental possibilism? Now, the scholars who have uh, 
propagated or the proponents of this environmental positivism strongly asserted that while the environment uh, does not necessarily contribute or do not directly cause uh, or influences a specific cultural developments, rather the presence of uh, a specific uh, or absence of specific environmental factors in a sense place limits on such uh, development by either permitting or forbidding their occurrences. Now, for example, if we look at some of the people who uh, inhabit an island, uh, can in a sense be a seafarers, but residents of uh, like Inner Mongolia could not be or maybe inhabitants of temperate regions might practice agriculture, but those living in Ar Arctic latitudes could not. Now, there is this possibilism, the idea of uh, possibilism uh, in essence tends to look at this. Now, from the works of uh, the American anthrop anthropologist uh, A. L. Krober, he showed that uh, for instance, the Indians of the Northwest, Northwestern North America could not adopt the agriculture practices of maids from their southern neighbors because the frost free growing season in their region was shorter than four months, or maybe a different way. Therefore, in a sense, uh, there is a possibility that uh, a certain agriculture crops does not really fit well and therefore, it is not being practiced. Now, therefore, the environment in a sense has thus limited the ability of their culture to evolve in an agriculture directions. Now, to cite uh, more example, there are certain communities who inhabit uh, a hill terrain. Now, in a hill terrain, it is difficult to practice now a wet rice cultivation or a terrace cultivation because of the steepness or because of the geogra geographical terrain. Now, by saying so. The environment to some extent has uh, in essence limit the ability of uh, a community to evolve from one particular practices to another practices. Now, therefore, it has to be seen that uh, environmental uh, possibilism in essence uh, has also a role to make a broader understanding of human ecology. Now, perhaps the first uh, possible stance was taken by uh, Arnold Tony B, a British historian, uh, in his extensive work uh, of a study of history. And in his work, he primarily argued that the development of civilizations could be explained in terms of their responses to environmental challenges. Now, this, this perhaps the works of uh, Arnold Tony B is a pioneer in terms of uh, he taking the possible stance. Now, in that cultures has to be in a sense located uh, in a benign tropics, which failed to evolve because they were not sufficiently uh, challenged by their environment. Now, uh, secondly, uh, as we had uh, explained about uh, certain example about the Eskimos in the environmental determinism. Now, since the Eskimos have uh, ha I mean, habited the extremely harsh uh, environmental conditions, they tend to uh, be engaged or 
far away from civilizations and they are considered to be primitive because of their uh, coping demands or the kind of adaptations which is being created by the environment. Now, those kind of uh, culture which in essence the environment of uh, sufficient, but not uh, excessive challenges had the possibility of progressing to higher states of civilization. Now, in essence there is a condition that if an environment to some extent has uh, in a way uh, influences the human community to in a way uh, be more positive to changes. Therefore, as I had said an example of the works of uh, James E. Scott, wherein he talks about the hills and the valley. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the kind of civilization which is normally being witnessed, uh, the, the valley dwellers or in essence the plain areas are much more developed in compared to the hill areas. Therefore, those environment who inhabited the valley areas are more perceptive to uh, changes and therefore, civilization is more uh, has much more positive in road in the context of the valley in compared to the hills. Now, therefore, there is a higher possibility of uh, the that kind of uh, civilization which in a sense gives preference or if not uh, they are able to adapt in a more positive manner. Now, if you look at the works of the British anthropologist that is Daryl Ford. Now, in his book uh, Habitat Economy and Society which was published in 1934, uh, he tries to look at uh, the scientific exploration of possibility that is between the physical environment and human activity. Now, in that he argued that there is always a middle term that is a collection of specific objective and values that is a body of knowledge and belief in other words a cultural pattern. Now, what is this cultural pattern? In trying to look at the uh, kind of uh, geographical terrain if not uh, the economic condition or the economic uh, production of and uh, the relationship between society. If you try to look in this uh, the linkages between the three, there is a possibility of uh, looking at the importance of looking at the cultural pattern. Well, after giving a brief uh, overview and, and uh, the theoretical premises uh, of how to situate uh, human ecology and how human ecology emerges and uh, the kind of theoretical approaches in which uh, the anthropologists and the historians tries to uh, come up with uh, different ideas. Now, after discussing that, uh, we will try to now look at uh, what ecological and ecological anthropology is, because primarily this course uh, tends to uh, take an ecological anthropology stand and uh, tries to understand the kind of uh, problems which are normally being uh, witnessed. Now, first and foremost, we will try to look at the basic premises of what uh, ecological anthropology is. It tends to uh, in a sense focus upon the complex relations between people and their environment. And as we know the human population in a sense have uh, an evolving if not an on ongoing uh, relationship with and also uh, in, in return it has an impact upon uh, 
the sort of uh, geographical area that is the climate uh, and uh, plants and animals and different kind of species uh, in their uh, surroundings for instance. And all these elements in a sense uh, have uh, a reciprocal relationship if not impacts on the humans. Now, therefore, uh, there is uh, a continuous interrelationship between the human uh, and uh, various other ecosystems. Now, therefore, this is perhaps the basic premises. And secondly, ecological anthropology also attempts to uh, understand the way how human tends to uh, perceive if not understand its environment and the subsequent manner in which these relations from the uh, kind of uh, human populations uh, relationship with their social economic and political life. Now, as we had discussed in the uh, human ecology, it, it further tries to broaden uh, because in the anthropology it, it tends to uh, situate the kind of impact it has uh, on the human culture in a more uh, intense and in a more in depth manner. Now, in a general understanding ecological anthropology also uh, attempts to provide uh, sort of a materialist explanation of human society and culture as a product of adaptation to a given environmental conditions. Now, many of the sort of ceremonies, rituals, for that matter, the kind of relationship which uh, evolve uh, among humans or humans and nature. It, it tends to uh, the ecological anthropology tends to encompass uh, all these relationships which exist between not just within the human society, but human and nature or rather human and environment. Now, it tends to uh, locate and understand uh, a sort of an explanation to this kind of relationship. Now, uh, first and foremost, uh, let us begin by looking at the works of Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin in his work, The Origin of Species, way back in 1859, he tries to uh, give us uh, an explanation, a synthetic theory of uh, evolution of human society, which is based on the idea of descent and modification, which is influenced ra rather by uh, Malthus, uh, which I will try to explain in the uh, next slide. Now, what Malthus as we all know was the first who tends to uh, relate uh, the environment or human society by specifically talking about population and he in a sense was uh, the pioneer in terms of uh, sort of bringing the idea of this population theory. Now, Darwin in a sense uh, by drawing the work drawing from the works of Malthus tends to give a synthetic theory. Now, what he says is uh, in every successive generations, uh, the individuals produce uh, much more, more than uh, what they can in a sense survive. That is because of limited resources and competition between individual arises. Now, how are these being influences? What actually has influences? an individual to compete among themselves. 
Now, uh, the capitalist might give a different uh, explanation or rather the Marxist understanding of these economic modes of production will give a different reflection on this. But then as human evolve, in a sense it tends to give, uh, there it, it arises the individual uh, to have uh, engaged in more of a competition in terms of sort of accumulation of wealth or production of uh, more wealth. Now, for instance, uh, individuals who are in a much more better position or sort of a favorable characteristic or variations in a sense uh, is able to survive to, to reproduce. Now, it is this environmental context that determines whether or not a trait is beneficial. Now, depending on the kind of environment an individual inhabit, it, it, it can have uh, either a negative if not a positive implications. Now, uh, who is Malthus as, uh, as we had uh, slightly talked about? Malthus strongly uh, discuss about how if the population is to grow exponentially and if there can be an imbalances between a population and the resources, which means uh, there will be uh, sort of uh, an imbalances between the, the demand and supply. That is the demand is the human and the supply is the resources. That is is the resources will the resources be able uh, adequate uh, to the rising population of human society. This is something which uh, uh, Malthus in essence has propagated in his work on Ishe of population which was published way back in 1798. Now, uh, in this work what Malthus strongly argue is uh, if the population in essence increase exponentially, now the population deplete their resources to such a degree that competition for survival becomes inevitable. That is only those who are capable or if not able or strong will survive because there will be uh, stiff competition owing to the availability of limited uh, resources. This, uh, this uh, theory assumes that a struggle for uh, existence will ensure and only a certain number of individuals will survive. Now, this idea of survive or survival again uh, is posited differently by Charles Darwin by borrowing from uh, uh, Malthus theory on the issue on population. That is, uh, Charles Darwin strongly talk about survival of the fittest and in his uh, idea of survival of the fittest, he also uh, strongly propagated that uh, it is not the strongest uh, and the fittest who is going to survive, but rather those who are able to adapt uh, will survive. That is the mark my words that is adaptation in a sense is the key to survival again. Now, Malthus ideas uh, in a sense influences to form an ecological basis for Darwin's theory of natural selection. Now, how is this Malthus ideas instrumental in uh, shaping this ecological basis? Because the natural resources in a sense uh, has an emphasis if not uh, an influence on the human understanding of uh, their environment. Now, uh, as 
he strongly posited in his essay on population. Malthus happens to uh, pioneer uh, in the field of demographic studies and uh, in, uh, he argued that human population naturally tends to outstrip their food supply that is uh, the increasing demands or the increasing populations in a sense tends to uh, outstrip uh, the supply from that is the natural resources. And these uh, imbalances between demand and supply uh, will eventually lead to disease and hunger and uh, which will put a limit to a growth of the human population as uh, Seymour and Smith uh, tends to observe. Now, uh, on this similar line, Haeckel coined uh, our modern understanding of ecology in way back in 1870, uh, in which he defined as uh, the study of the economy that is of the household of animal organism. And this in a sense includes the relationship of animals with uh, the inorganic and the organic environments and above all there is a beneficial and uh, inimical relationship between uh, uh, what Darwin referred to as the conditions of struggle of existence. Now, what is this conditions of struggle of existence? Now, as uh, the human population will in a sense exponentially grow, there will be a struggle among the human species for existence. Now, in a lighter wind, uh, Malthus in a sense uh, posits that uh, the war which is uh, has constantly uh, checked the population of human growth. As you know, uh, uh, in, in a war people uh, get killed and then the, therefore, in a sense uh, war in a sense is seen to be a positive measure in order to control the human population. Now, if you look around uh, globally if not even in the Indian context, now the exponential rise of population in a sense is seen uh, to be in a perceived to be in a in a alarming manner because we tend to say that if uh, there is a more of a population, it is impossible uh, to sort of uh, cater to the needs of every bit of uh, individuals. Now, for instance, if you take the case of let us say unemployment. Now, in the Indian context, perhaps uh, it could be because of uh, we have that uh, population over overpopulation because there is this imbalances between the demand and supply because there is an increasing demand for jobs but the government is not in a way in a position to supply or cater to the uh, rising demands of these jobs now uh, let's try to look at uh, Give, give a recap of what ecosystem which in a sense, uh, in a sense I have discussed in the uh, first, first two uh, lectures. Now, an ecosystem uh, has to be uh, uh, understood from a structural and functional interrelationship that is persistence among the living organisms and the environment of which they are part of it that is the structural and the functional interrelationship among uh, various living organisms that is um, not just the human, but also are the uh, living beings. Now, first and foremost uh, modern study of soils in the Amazon is an example of this micro leveled 
uh, ecosystem analysis. Now, Morant is again uh, a specialist in the ecological anthropology and uh, also in resource management and agricultural development. Now, in his study in Brazil, uh, in the Amazon, his micro level uh, uh, ecosystem analysis of soil uh, revealed that substantial areas of uh, nutrient rich soils, which are completely overlooked in the macro level analysis. Now, which means uh, Moran tries to uh, uh, posit that we, we need to focus to a micro level ecosystem analysis of soils, if uh, one has to look at the structural and functional relationship among living organisms vis a vis the environment. Now, uh, again uh, as a reaction to what uh, Darwin's theory, because uh, Darwin focuses on uh, the alarming increase of population and he tends to perceive population as something uh, which is not really uh, fundamental if not equitable to uh, their available resources. Now, there are some uh, anthropologists who in a sense uh, uh, reject if not does not agree with what the idea of Darwin and uh, they tends to uh, come up with this idea of environmental determinism as a mechanism for explanation. So, in a sense environmental determinism uh, as we had discussed uh, uh, in the theoretical premise of human ecology as something which is uh, sort of not a challenge, but contradicti contradicting to uh, Darwin's theory. Now, one of the earliest attempts in the environmental determinism was to map out the cultural features of uh, human uh, populations according to their environmental information. For example, the correlations were drawn between natural features and human technologies. Again, human technologies is important here. Now, Bronislav Malinowski was perhaps uh, one of the pioneer anthropologists who carried out uh, an ethnographic accounts of the Boas, that is uh, the Boas community, tends to sort of uh, come up with uh, the idea that uh, the environmental determinism in a sense could not sufficiently account for observe realities uh, and rather there can be a weaker form of uh, determinism which began to emerge. Now, the works of uh, Malinowski among the boss in a sense uh, made us to realize that environmental de determinism alone could not sufficiently uh, give uh, a detailed account or an observation or realities uh, from that perspective. Now, at this particular point of time, uh, the works of Julian Stewart, who tends to you know give uh, much more of an emphasis on the adaptive mechanism or adaptive responses to similar environments, that in a sense uh, gave to the rise of cultural similarities and uh, alternative to that he coined a term called cultural ecology. Now, uh, cultural ecology is in a sense uh, which evolved from this cultural uh, sort of environmental determinism, because it, it, it has to be seen in ecology has to be seen in relationship between uh, the human culture. Now, uh, the contribution of Julian Stewart in a sense in the in ecological anthropology is enormous and uh, his work uh, primarily center on uh, 
the culture core. Uh, now, in his, uh, in the works of that culture core, he, uh, in a sense, give an emphasis on the the constellations of features, which are most closely related to uh, subsistence activities and economic arrangements. Now, uh, in this culture core, uh, Stewart, in a sense, tries to give. Uh, a much more emphasis on uh, the kind of uh, subsistence activities uh, of how a community stands to engage in certain kind of economic arrangement. Now, in this, uh, in trying to understand this uh, economic arrangement, Stewart uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, in a lower lower population densities. Uh, it, there is where the tree is sparsely distributed. Thus, illit, uh, he illust, illustrate or give uh, an explanation that there is a direct relationship between resource base and population density. Now, in a way, uh, he tries to look at how uh, a few population, in a sense, uh, flourish if, if, if not prosper that is he tends to posit from the idea of these subsistence activities. Now, uh, I will try to explain this uh, further in a much more clear way in the upcoming lectures by citing certain uh, case studies. Now, Stewart was also uh, pretty much uh, interested in uh, the explanation of this relationship uh, between that is the uh, regards to water av availability and management. That is uh, sort of the resource management. His ideas of uh, this cultural ecology again uh, was inf influenced by uh, his uh, studies which was focused on uh, the South American and indigenous group. Now, again the availability of this water or management of resources, he tends to focus on uh, the kind of knowledge system which the indigenous communities have in the South America. Now, this knowledge system has to be understood uh, in the context of how the communities were able to uh, sustainably, you know, uh, utilize uh, the resources or how well they manage if not use the resources. Now, in his study, he comes up with uh, engaged in three particular uh, in, uh, understanding or un investigations of cultural ecology. Now, the first is he tends to look at describing at the uh, understanding at the natural resources and the kind of technology which was uh, used to extract and process them. Now, why is technology important in the context of extracting uh, or rather exploiting the resources? Because technology in a sense determines uh, how well a community is able to engage in the sustainably using the resources or not. And secondly, he also outlined uh, the social organization of uh, work for the subsistence and economic activities. And thirdly, he also tries to trace the influences of these two phenomena uh, on other aspects of culture. Now, therefore, uh, in a sense, uh, Stewart often fluctuate between the uh, idea of this determinism and possibilism. And uh, we can in a say uh, in a way uh, say that he was more interested in uh, trying to engage in a comparative studies uh, or com uh, using comparative method in order to discover these uh, the laws of cultural phenomena. Uh, which was again 
uh, espoused by uh, Birfield. Now, therefore, how does one strives to engage or locate uh, in the understanding the cultural ecology of a particular society? Now, Stewart has pointed out these uh, three important steps of, in, uh, of engaging an investigation of a cultural ecology of a particular society. Now, uh, way back in the 60s and 1960s and 70s, uh, cultural ecology and uh, environmental determinism uh, in a sense uh, tends to sort of decline uh, or if not uh, wane away in the within the discipline of anthropology. Now, ecological anthropologists tends to uh, engage in forming a new uh, school of thought which include the ecosystem model and also uh, a sub brand sub discipline like ethno ecology and historical ecology. And uh, with these sub disciplines, uh, researchers in the field of uh, ecological anthropology uh, have a strong uh, urge and hope that the study on adaptations would provide uh, a particular explanations of customs and institutions that is how a human institutions is influenced if not uh, to be uh, understood in the context of human and environment. Now, uh, in essence uh, by incorporating all these uh, subfields ecological anthropologists believe that uh, the populations are not engaged with the total environment around them, but rather uh, with a habitat consisting of certain selected aspects of the uh, local ecosystem. Now, again this uh, local ecosystem is given importance here. Now, uh, furthermore, its population in a sense has its own uh, mechanism of adaptations which in a sense over a period of time is institutionalized in the culture of that particular group, especially through their use of technologies. Now, this technologies again is developed and it has evolved over a period of time depending on the kind of uh, adaptation which a human society has uh, tends to cope with the environment and this uh, adaptive mechanism is being institutionalized uh, within that cultural group. And, then, and in partially, uh, partly it becomes sort of a part of their culture. Uh, those practices in a sense rather. Now, what then is ethnoecology? Uh, eth ethnoecology can in a sense uh, tends to look at uh, the paradigm and uh, investigates native thought about the environmental phenomena, the phenomena in which uh, it operates. and. Uh, of a particular uh, native uh, society, how they operate in the particular environmental phenomena. And uh, in the, it also looked at uh, how a particular, it focuses on the indigenous classifications uh, of hierarchies referring to a particular aspects of environment. Now, for instance, uh, the kind of soil types, plants and animals which a particular uh, communities engage upon. Now, these are some of the uh, fields how or into which ethnoecology look at. We can also uh, partly mention about uh, ethnomedicine, how a particular uh, native 
societies have uh, engaged upon uh, the environment or it tries to look at uh, sort of the medicinal plants, their knowledge, know how of that community and then through that engagement how they are able to sort of uh, use that knowledge for their own benefit. Now, those are some of the sort of subfields of uh, ecological anthropology. Now, what is the relevance of ecological anthropology and why do we uh, feel that uh, within anthropology, why is the need or to focus on ecological anthropology. Now, a field such as uh, ecological anthropology uh, in essence is primarily relevant to uh, the contemporary concerns with the state of a general environment and the kind of knowledge uh, within anthropology uh, has sort of the advantage or potential to sort of uh, uh, provide an information regarding uh, the human society about uh, how to construct a sustainable ways of life. Now, again uh, sustainability or sustainable uh, development has in essence uh, tends to occupy a very important uh, topic if not theme in recent times and perhaps uh, ecological anthropology in a sense is able to sort of investigate further how human populations uh, tends to engage in a much more uh, a sustainable ways of life uh, by uh, different forms of different settings or in different environments. In the ecological anthropology has strongly uh, focused by demonstrating the city. Now, of studying different culture groups and trying how different culture groups tend if not operate uh, differently in different Biological, biological diversity adaptation and survival of all and within this cultural diversity may serve it is clearly uh, one of the most important now uh, biological seen or in relationship with uh, this is uh, this course or if not thank you